the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from Pastor Jen Cobray. Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus, giving you all the praise, all the glory, all the honor. How good it is to be in the house of the Lord. We thank you, Father, for a mighty move of your spirit in this place because, Lord, we haven't come to hear from a man. We've come to hear from the teacher of the church, which is the Holy Spirit. Welcome, Holy Spirit. Touch us, heal us, strengthen us, encourage us, guide us, guard us. Direct us and motivate us to be all that you'd have us to be. And, Lord, we'll give you the praise, glory, and all the honor. Bless all the churches in the Inland Empire as well as around the planet that are preaching and hearing the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, bless our Baptist brothers and Lutherans and Methodist Episcopalian, Charismatics, Pentecostals, Calvary Chapels, Harvest, Oak Valley, and Oasis, Inland Christian Center, the Assemblies of God, Foursquare Denomination. We thank you for Trinity Emmanuel Baptist Ecclesia Church. We thank you for our Catholic brothers and sisters and Adventist brothers and sisters. At no time do we think of ourselves or see ourselves as better than them, but we we, Lord, see ourselves as co-laborers, workers together in one field, building one kingdom, and that's yours. And God will give you the praise, glory, and all the honor. In Jesus, great, mighty, marvelous name, with a great big shout, we all say, amen. amen. Take your seat, get your Bible. Let's have a little Bible study tonight. Let's have something that we can learn something about ourselves and about God, that when we walk out of this place tonight, and there's only two ways you're getting out of this place tonight. You're either walking out or we're carrying you out. And I'm praying that you're going to walk out of this place tonight. And so the word of God, when you leave with it, you're going to have it on the inside of you. And it, it really ought to change your life. You know, we come to church not just to put our penance in or do our time. No, don't do that. You come to church to hear about yourself, about God, what God wants, what God's ways are, what he desires of you, how to be, how to get through those moments of burdens that you've been carrying and keep on going with God because the Bible says clearly, he that endures to the end shall be saved. My job is to get you to endure to the end. And so we want to make sure that you get something from the word of the Lord every time this church gathers together. Very important. That'll help you be strong, grow to maturity. When the pressures of life come, hey, they'll be like water off a duck's back. They'll come and they'll just go away. Because you're so strong in Jesus, the answer to everything is him, Christ. And you just move on in God. And that's why we go to the word of the Lord. I'm going to go to the words of Jesus tonight. You know, we've been for months in Matthew, the fifth chapter. I want to take you back. Remember how we finished on the, the Beatitudes and the, you know, the supremely blessed. But I was just kind of like reading past that and the spirit of the Lord spoke to me. It was really interesting. I, I just want to read you the verses and, and then I'm going to come back and give you the title of the message. If we'll start in Matthew 13 verse... It says, you are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It is then good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled under by men's foot, or by men. You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket but on a lampstand and gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Tonight's message, if you're making a note, is light up your world. It's funny because I was driving down the street the other day noticing Christmas lights and I'm thinking about the tradition of Christmas lights since I was a child I've seen them and I've enjoyed them. I know you do too. Some of you even go all over the place looking for certain neighborhoods that really go all out putting up Christmas lights. The tradition of the Christmas light is that Jesus is the light that lit up the world. 
And you see that in John, the very first chapter, how Jesus is the light of all men. Without him, they're in darkness. And it's funny because we can see and think about Jesus being the light of the world, but one of the things we have a hard time relating with is the very fact that what I just read to you, Jesus, who is the light of the world, now says something about you. You are the light of the world. And I can understand that Jesus is the light of the world, but when you now put that on me, I don't know how to be the light of the world. I don't know what that really means. How is it that I can possibly be a, the light and carry the light of God so the lost and dying world could see the works of God and give God glory? That's what he says. And he makes that statement that's a powerful statement found in um, verse number 14. It says, and you are the light of the world. And then in verse 16, he says, let your light so shine. In other words, it's your option as to whether or not you let the light shine. But if I don't know how to let the light shine, I, I'll just think that's something God tells me to do and I never get around to doing it. Tonight, I had a, by my bed, I, had a, I turned on a light and it didn't go on, so I switched the bulbs around. Now I, you know, I, I like the old bulbs that put off the yellow light. You know, I know that you guys are all ecology freaks and don't and uh, think of me as horrible. But if I can find those kind of bulbs, I'll buy them. I, I, you know, I just don't like those little twisty lights. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? When the government tells me what kind of lights I'm buying, that really bothers me. I'll buy whatever light I want to buy. But anyway, I won't go there. I'm going to go to the Word, okay? And, you know, so the light went out, and I went down, and I tried to find a, one of those yellow lights and couldn't find it and found, you know, one of the, you know, ecology lights that twist around, and they throw off a different light. It's a white light. I know Debbie's going to hate that, and I know when I go home, they'll, she will find a yellow light somewhere and put it there because she doesn't like those white lights either. You know, they're fluorescent. And so the point being is this, and I don't even remember what my point is now. Oh, yes, now I remember. <laughs> Unless somebody puts in the light and turns it on, who knows what's happening? Yeah. Yeah. You know, in other words, there's a light there, and I can have the light, but unless it's on, it doesn't work. And so I got to have the light, and I am the light, but unless the light's on, it doesn't work. And if I don't know how to be the light of the world, then how in the world can I turn my light on? And most Christians say, yes, you're salt and you're light, but they don't know any more than that. And if you don't know how to be the one that turns on the light, it doesn't do any good. Is anybody following me? So I can have a light bulb in the stand, in the light, and never turn it on and never appreciate, never light up the room. But it's still a light, isn't it? And it's still a lamp, isn't it? And it's still where it's supposed to be. But until I turn it on, it better work. And sometimes God turns us on and we don't work. Because we don't know what it's like to be the light that he calls us to. Is everybody listening? And so tonight, I just want to share with you some principles on what lights up a man. It's kind of interesting this week, I... I found myself around people this morning. I was doing business with a man. He didn't know who I was. He didn't know I was a minister. And I, I didn't know who he was either. We were just doing business together. And during our conversation this morning, I, I, I was talking to him, and I just saw something about this man. I, I would guess that he was probably 10 or 15 years younger than me. And I, I, I just saw something about this man, and all of a sudden I said to myself, I'll bet he's a Christian. And then I stopped right there, and I listened to his conversation a little bit more, and then, you know, every now and then a, a word would come out like blessed, which gave me the clue that he was a Christian, because usually people that aren't Christians don't ever use the word blessed. And then he used the word, he says, I can't do that that night, because I was asking him to do something. He says, my church has an activity. I said, ah. Oh, I knew you were a Christian. What was it in him that made him that little holy beamer that I saw his light? 
I'll tell you what it was. It was simply this. It was his facial expressions. It was simply somebody who you could see didn't carry the burdens of the world, wasn't down, wasn't depressed, wasn't discouraged, wasn't frustrated, wasn't one who was squashed by the failures of the economy. He was just somebody who had a light coming from him and the light was in his eyes, the light was in his words, the light was in his smile, the light was in the, the, the wrinkles in his face when he, when he shined out a little bit and I just knew he was a Christian. You ever been around somebody like that? And there's just something inside of people that when they act like nothing in the world is bothering them and they are thrilled about who they are, your light starts to shine. And until you get off your problems, get off your trials, get off your burdens, get off the stuff of the world, get off the ecology, get off the economics, get off all the stuff and the people who say the world's going to fail. Can I tell you, did you ever read your Bible? The world is going to burn up. Yes, global warming. God's going to nuke it all. Get over it. And so why worry about anything if God's got it all under control? And until you get to the place where you are solid in him, you will never let your light shine because you're always depressed by stuff that around you. Does everybody listen? And I don't know about you, but I, I would love to be that holy beamer for Jesus everywhere I go. I find that my personality, I'm too serious. No, I am. I'm too serious. I know you know that already. And I'm I just too serious. When, in fact, what we ought to be doing is having a lot of fun in life. Because people have fun. The rest of the world is not having fun. They will look to you and find out, what is it that's in you that lets you have so much fun? And you can say, simple, man. I went to church last night. I had a big weight on me, and I dropped it at the altar, and I'm free. And all of a sudden, the, you're this holy beamer. You're this guy that's carrying the light, but you can't carry the light. You can't turn on the light if you've got a bunch of burdens, because the one who gave you the light is Jesus. Does anybody listen? So the question is, some things in Scripture, I want to, Find out what the Bible says. Did you know that the Bible says a lot about this? What lights up a man? Three things from the scripture that'll help you to light up your life. Is that okay? So that the world can look at you because they want to, they, believe me, they want to be around somebody who's got good news. They don't want to be around somebody who's a sourpuss looking like they're losing and barely making it. And it's all reflected in our light. Whether we turn it on or don't turn it on. By who's on the inside of us more than anything else. Now here's some things really quick. Now this is, uh, this is what lights up a man. Now women, you just write the word woman in there. This is whatever. <laughs> don't email me about that. What lights up a man? Num uh, number one, a person that sees God. I'm doing business with this guy. It wasn't exactly the best thing in the world that he I was hiring him to do. And yet he was so on God, he didn't care about what he was doing. And sometimes we see other things besides God. We see the problems, we see the pressures, we see people that hurt us, we see uh, the failures of our life, we see our checking accounts, savings accounts, we see our boss's face. <laughs> Why? What are you all doing that for? You should love that person. Say, I do. Wait a minute. You should love that person, your boss. And you should say, I do. Because the Bible says your boss is he that's in heaven. See, and that's exactly my point, is you got your eyes on the wrong stuff. The real boss is in heaven. Did you hear what happened when I said you should love your boss? Everybody went, Ugh. why? Because you got your eyes on the wrong boss. 
But when you got your eyes on God, and it's easy to do, may I say something? You do not see with your eyes. You see with your heart. So whatever you put your heart on is what you're seeing. And if you have your heart fixed on Jesus, no matter what the earthly boss is doing, you've got to be in love with your heavenly boss. And so every time there's something coming along, what do you see? Do you see the problem? Do you see the trial, the pressure? Do you see all this? Or do you see Jesus? See, in order for my light to stay on, it has to be energized by something. And that's the one who lives on the inside of me. But if I don't bring the one that's on the inside of me to the situation, then I get depressed, discouraged. I don't like people. Am I the only one in here? You know what I'm talking about. It's Christmas. Do we have to have them over? You know what I'm talking about. You're laughing because you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> yes, but we'll be Christians. Well, if you get off of them and get on him, then your experience with them becomes like him. And it becomes, and it's all who you see. And it's always that way. And that's why a lot of people, they see the wrong things. Yeah, you got problems. Yes, people are letting you down. Yes, you hear about stuff that's discouraging. Yes, there's trials and, oh man, who needs this? Why does this even have to happen? Get off of that stuff. Get on what you're supposed to see, which is the one who lives on the inside of you that gives you the light so you can be that holy beamer, beaming out the light to a lost and dying world that needs to see your reaction in a world that's failing about how successful you are. That's the work they need to see. Is anybody listening? Now, now the, 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 let me give you a scripture on this. Is that okay? Uh, we go with me to Exodus 34 chapter. Here we got Moses. Moses is before the children of Israel. He keeps going up and talking to God atop the mountain. I don't know if you've ever read this or not, but when he comes back down, the Bible says his face is lit up. The word that they use is shone. I don't know what shone means. I would say sh uh, shine. But it's the old English word shone, which means, which we don't say, how's your shone? We don't talk that way. So it's, uh, it's shone. And, and so we find that his face was just shining. Now for when we read this, we say, oh, his face is lit up. Stop for a moment. Think about how much his face has to be lit up in order for you to be afraid of it. Have you ever seen somebody come off the beach and they are lit up, man? Have you ever seen like, like Debbie or Luke? They have, they have no pigment in their skin. And when they, when they go to the ocean and they get sunburned, that's it, man. They look literally like a lobster with hair. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I mean, I, but never have I ever seen them pink or red that I was ever afraid of them. So this is beyond, Moses was beyond. Because when he came back and the children of Israel saw his face, they were petrified and they made him take a veil and put it over his face. So he's talking to the people with it through a veil because they were afraid of his face because it lit up so much. Why? Because he was talking to God. And when he was face to face with God, his face lit up. Now, could that tell us something? Now watch this. Let's read the verses ourselves. In fact, just pop it up on the overhead. Um, Exodus 34, starting in verse number 29. Let's do this. Now, it was so that when Moses came down from Mount Sinai, and the two tablets of the testimonies were in Moses' hands, and when he came down from the mountain, verse B part, please, and Moses did not know that his skin of his face shone while he talked with him. In other words, while he was talking with him, his face, God lit up his face. Why is that in the Bible? Could it be that when Moses was fixed on God, he was the light? And when you're fixed on God, you're the light. Go to the next verse. 
So Aaron and all the children of Israel saw Moses. Behold, the skin of his face shone, and they were afraid of him to come near him. Go to verse number 35, if you will. And, and whenever the children of Israel saw the face of Moses, that the skin of Moses' face shone, that Moses would put a veil on his face again until he went to speak with God. And he took the veil off. In other words, whatever you got your face into is what you will show. Let me say it again. Whatever you got your, you got your face into the problem, that's what you're going to show. You got your face into the situation, that's what you'll show. Now, let me give you a scripture on that. Listen to what the Bible says in Psalms 35. Pop it up on the overhead for us. In Psalms 35. I sought the Lord, verse number four, and he heard me and delivered me from all of my fears. Go to verse number five. And they looked to him and were radiant. And their faces were not ashamed. The word radiant means their faces lit up. They became a light. Why? Someone says, well, if I was like Moses face to face with God, my face would light up too. Wait a minute. Notice what it says. It doesn't say they were face to face. Listen to what it says. They looked not at him, to him. I can understand my face getting lit up. I can understand being light of the world if I saw Jesus face to face like Moses saw God. I can understand that, but that's not what he says. He's not saying you gotta be face to face with him. You just gotta look to him. And when you look to him at that moment, guess what? Your whole face starts to change because now your face is in him and your face will reflect him. Is anybody listening? Talk about light of the world. We're talking about an interesting subject. What lights up man? First one is a person that sees God. You've got to see God. Look to him. The second one, what lights up man? A person of godly wisdom. Somehow you just know beyond what everybody else is thinking. You know why? Because everybody tells you where they're at by what they say and what they do. Did you know that the Bible makes it very clear that out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks? He's not just talking about words. He's talking about the lifestyle of somebody. In other words, you can do business with people be so far advanced than them, you know you have to back off because you know where they're coming from. You can see where their problems are. You know where they're going. You know what they're going to do because out of their lifestyle, it speaks. And the wisdom of God comes in and now takes over instead of manly wisdom and earthly wisdom. When you have the wisdom of God, it's superior than the wisdom of man of the earth. And I'll tell you, when you know the answers before the question's even asked, you're a happy boy. And your face is going to reflect it. Ecclesiastes, the eighth chapter, you ought to go there and check it out with me. In verse number one, it says, Who is like a wise man? Talk about wisdom this entire time. We're talking about the wisdom of God. Ecclesiastes, the eighth chapter, verse number one. Who is like a wise man? And who knows the interpretation of a thing? A man's wisdom makes his face shine. When a man has the wisdom of God, all of a sudden the problems of the world are gone because he's got the answers to the problems because God has already explained what it's going to be all about. You ought to know about the people. You ought to know the situation. You know what's happening tomorrow. You know what's happening next week. You got it all under control. Can I tell you something? Life almost gets boring because you got it so in control with wisdom of God, you know what's going to how and it's going to play out. And it's like, pfft. now listen, a person with godly wisdom. Let me give you an illustration of that one more time. You're in the Old Testament. Go with me to the book of Daniel. Daniel, the 12th chapter. When you go to Daniel, the 12th chapter, let's take a look at verse 3. Those who are wise, we're talking about a godly man with godly wisdom, are somebody whose face is going to shine up. Those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the firmament. 
And those who turn many to righteousness shall be like stars forever and ever. So we find two things now that will help your face to shine in the midst of an ugly and perverse world that's getting darker all the time. The first thing is simply this, that you see God in everything. God's in control. He can take care of it all. He knows what he's doing. He loves me. He's got it. I'm in his grip. And nobody's going to take me out of his ha- hand and out of his heart. The second thing is you got godly wisdom. In other words, what the Bible says is what's going to happen, not what people say or think. That's not going to happen. So you have the wisdom that takes you to the place where life is already easily figured out. And your face starts to shine because you have the answer before it ever is a question. Number three, what lights up a man? One who stands for righteousness. When you make a stand for righteousness, in other words, the right way, God's way of doing things, it brings a smile, it brings the light the world can see. There's this guy in the Bible, his name is Stephen, New Testament. He's a martyr. Tell you the truth, Paul the Apostle killed him, murdered him. Can you imagine the man that wrote two-thirds of the New Testament? The apostle, the great man of God, was a murderer before God used him. Well, by the way, in case you didn't know that, David was too. So there's hope for some of you that are in here. I'm only kidding. There's hope for all of us. In Acts, the sixth chapter, it talks about this. Talking about a man of righteousness and how because he walks in the ways not of men, but of the right ways of God, there's just something about it that makes him a light wherever he goes. Verse number eight of Acts, the sixth chapter, it says, and Stephen, full of faith and power, man, isn't that cool? Did great wonders and signs among the people. Man, and when he did these great signs and Wonders among the people, those that were the Pharisees of the temple got really mad. The Bible says they actually plotted against him and lied about him, saying that he was blaspheming God, which he didn't do. Paul was part of that. Imagine that. His name was Saul of Tarsus. He was the head of the synagogue of Tarsus at the time. He hadn't been converted yet on the road to Damascus. So it was Saul of Tarsus, not yet Paul the Apostle. And they plot against this guy, Stephen. Stephen makes his petition before the council. He says these things in verse 15 before they kill him. Acts, the sixth chapter, verse 15 says, And all who sat on the council looked steadfastly at him and saw his face as the face of an angel. And yet they still plotted against him. And yet religion still came in and killed him. Because that's what religion will do. Saw his face as a face of an angel. Why? Because he carried a banner of righteousness. Tonight when Jesus makes a statement, not about the house lights for Christmas and not about just him being the light of the world, which we all understand, but when he says he is the light of the world, then he comes along and says, you that are born of the Spirit of God now, you're the one that carries that light to a lost and dying world. Now you know how to turn your light on because you can be the light and never turn on and never get the job done. And now you know how to turn the light on. And the number one thing we see out of the scripture is that in every situation, you have got to see God, not yourself, not the people, not the wrongdoing, not the problem, trial or pressure, but you've got to put your heart on God and look to him. Secondly, you're going to have to be somebody who has godly wisdom so that you know the answers to life before the question is ever asked. And thirdly, and that's what you do when you get in here, you're gathering this godly wisdom. And thirdly, you're going to have to be somebody who stands for the right thing 
God is the right thing. God is the right, right way. God's righteousness in the face of darkness and it will light up your life and somehow just comes across. You don't even know it. People look at you and see something different in you because you have been doing what the scripture says. In the midst of problems, you see Jesus. You operate in godly wisdom and you are somebody who's going to stand for righteousness. You cannot make decisions for others, but you can make decisions for yourself. It's your call and it's your choice. You are the light of the world. Turn your face on and let the world see what it's like to be a Christian who has got their heart in righteousness in the wisdom of God and also has their heart set on God himself, the King of kings and the Lord of lords who's got it all under control. Somebody ought to give the Lord a great big praise. Now, don't go to anybody at work and say, you need to turn your light on. <laughs> How to turn their light on is you turn your light on first. Simple as that. You can't stay depressed and down around someone who's up and alive and the light. So if you want to change your world, keep your light on. If God spoke to you tonight, come on, give him a great big praise the Lord. Merry Christmas. God is so good to us. Let's, let's, um, let's, um, let's everybody remain seated. Let me just talk, chat with you just for a few moments. I want to make sure everybody's all right with God before you go. So I just want to just talk to you. You know, you can't, listen to me now, just for a moment. Listen, listen, listen. You can't get to heaven because you think you're okay with God. You can't make it to heaven because you feel you're a nice person. You cannot get to heaven because you say you love God. You cannot get to heaven because you go to church once in a while and you're not against God and you're not wholehearted for God, but you're not against God. The only way to get to heaven is God's way. Jesus said I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man goes to the Father. That means you, that means me. No man goes to the Father except by me. That's what Jesus said. You're going to get there. You're going to have to get there his way, not your way, not my way, or some well-meaning church committee's way. We're going to have to get to heaven God's way. And I know there's some of you in here tonight you think you're going to get to heaven, but if you die in the next few minutes, you're going to go to hell and somebody needs to tell you. Because you don't go to heaven because you came to church tonight. And you don't go to heaven because you're a good person. You get to heaven because you got to heaven God's way. Now listen, I'll tell you what God's way is. In John the third chapter, Jesus tells us how to get to heaven. He says these words, you must be born again. Now, a lot of times when we hear the words born again, we immediately turn off because we've seen born again people on television, they look a bit weird. Hollywood, for an example, has made them look like idiots and radicals and crazy people and fanatics in movies and books and stories. But that's not what he's talking about. When you hear the words born again, here's what you need to know, what born again means. Born again means this, from the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible. It means this, that you have given God all of your heart, you have given God all of your life. You see, it's an all or nothing relationship with Jesus Christ. All or nothing, that's what it means. And you're going to have to give God all of your heart and give God all of your life. The reason I say give it because 
and I'm stressing that, it's because, listen to this, he's not a thief to rob it from you. It's your heart and your life. He's not a conniver to talk you out of your heart or a manipulator just to make you do this. I mean, stop and think about it. I say this every week. God could make a trillion robots that all worship him, sing songs to him, repeat how wonderful he is, give him praise. A trillion robots, but he didn't. He made you and gave you a free will choice to either choose him or not choose him, whether to give him all of your heart, like he gave you, or not to give him all of your heart. It's your call, it's your choice. And tonight, here we are. We've had a great time in the Word of God. We had a great time in worship tonight. Praise. You let the burdens of life go. You saw the Spirit of God touch your people's lives. We had a great time hearing the things of the Lord. Man, but don't leave this place the same. For some of you in here, you have never given God all of your heart. You have never given God all of your life, and you know it. You know who he is in your head or you wouldn't be here. I know you know who he is. You celebrate Christmas every year. You celebrate Easter every year. You know who Jesus is, the baby in the manger. You know about the resurrection. You know who he is. You have head knowledge about who he is. No doubt. But that won't get you to heaven because it's what you've done with your heart that's going to make the difference. And you're going to have to give him all of your heart. You're going to have to give him all of your life like he gave to you. And it's your choice. So here we are in this safe and friendly place tonight. In this place, God is calling you home. Tonight is your divine appointment with God. You're going to give God all of your heart. You're going to give God all of your life. It's an all or nothing relationship and tonight is your night of salvation. Are you listening? Tonight is your night of salvation. Tonight is your night of salvation. You say, Pastor Jim, how do I do that? Let's do it God's way. Jesus said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father. But if you deny me, I'll deny you. In a moment, I'll count to three. I'll go like this. One, two, three, and I'll pop my hands together and I'll go like this. Bang! When you hear that sound, bang! Your hand goes up. And when I see your hand go up, what you're saying by the raising of your hand is, I don't want Jesus in my head like most Americans. I want to give him all of my heart, give him all of my life, be born again, headed for heaven, and denying my presence in hell. I'll see your hand go up. Remember, he said, if you confess me where before man, I'm a man, I'll see it. I'll confess you as mine before my Father. Tonight, it's your night of salvation. I'm going to count to three in a moment, pop my hands together. Who should raise their hand if you've been running from God instead of to God? I'm speaking to you. If you've never given him all of your heart, if you've never given him all of your life, I'm speaking to you. If you're one of those people that are not sure, make sure tonight is your night of salvation. I'm counting to three. Here it is. Are you ready to go? Get ready to pop your hand up. You say, wait a minute, Pastor. If I raise my hand, I'll be embarrassed. Somebody will see me. Uh-huh. They might. But it's better that God sees you than other people. Who cares what people think and see? It's more important that God sees you. And don't, don't not do this because you're afraid of people. You should be afraid of God more and get your hand up. Are you all over this place? Are you ready to go? I'm counting to three. Pop my hands together. You get your hand up. Are you ready? Here it is. One, two, Three, let me see your hands, let me see your hands. There's one, two, three, four, thank you, thank you. There's five, God bless you. There's six, thank you. There's seven, God bless you. There's eight, thank you. There's nine, there's 10, thank you. There's 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, thank you. God bless you. Anybody else that I didn't get, you didn't get your hand? 16, 17, God bless you. Anybody else? Need to get your hand up. Look, I didn't, I didn't bother them. I didn't point them out. I didn't make them feel uncomfortable. Don't miss this opportunity 
to meet up with God tonight. There's 16 wise people. Anybody else? Anybody else? Anybody else? Anybody else? Let's give the Lord a great big praise for 16 wise people. Here's what I want you to do. All 16 of you, I want you to get a hold of your coat, purse, sweater, Bible, friend. Get your stuff. Is that okay? Get your stuff. I want you to get your coat, get a friend, get your stuff, get in the aisle, and meet me right here in front. All 16 of you, if you're 17, 18, 19, you didn't raise your hand, but you know you should have, get out of your seat and come meet me right here. You come right now. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. Lord, I give you my heart. I give you my soul. Come on, come on, come on. I live for you alone. It's every breath that I take, every moment I'm away. Oh, they're coming. Give them a hand as they come. Come on, you come too. Come on, all the family room. Hurry, hurry, hurry. Come. Lord, I give you my heart. I give you my soul. I live for you. Alone. Well, thank God you guys have come. I want you to look over here. It's Dr. Becker. We call him Dr. B, like A, B, C. Dr. Becker, wave at him one more time. He's a good guy. He's going to do three things. He's going to pray with you to invite Jesus into your heart. That's number one. You need to do that. Number two, he's going to give you some free information, free literature about what to do next. Now that you're a Christian, don't you want to know what God wants from you? Well, of course you do. This literature will help you to figure that out and, and go forward with God. Third thing he's going to do is introduce you to a program we have that will help you get strong and stay strong in Jesus so you don't fall through the cracks and go back doing the same old stuff. It's called Spiritual Personal Trainers. We call them SBTs. Spiritual Personal Trainer will meet you before church service. Buy you, buy you. You don't buy them. They buy you. Coffee, tea, nachos, cookies, whatever it is you need, go over some scripture with you. Pray for you during the week. You need a friend to pray for you. We're here for you. We want to help you go get strong in Jesus. So let us do that. Remember, you said you're going to give God all of your heart. You said you're going to give God all of your life. Let us help you to do that. Only takes a few moments. Make a left turn. Follow Pastor Becker right over this way. Thank you, Dr. Becker. Come on, give the Lord a great big praise.